Welcome to the Geekscape Book Club. Very excited to talk today about the Mighty Thor, Thunder in Her Veins, which is Mighty Thor, parentheses, 2015, issues one through five. As always, I am Christian Blatt, back for the attack, the one, the only, Michael Shirley. Hey, you guys. And uh, down down low, on the down low, is the one, the Uh-oh. only, Count Eric Connor. For our visual audience listed as bro Jane Foster. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. Right. How appropriate that when we talk about the mighty Thor, derisively referred to within these pages as Lady Thor, or, quote, a girl with a hammer, uh, we only have men assembled to discuss this, but uh, we will do our best to uh, navigate these stories and uh, share our thoughts with all of you. I have uh, asked neither of these gentlemen what they thought of this story. And just a quick refresher for anybody who's catching our show for the first time. The concept of the Geekscape Book Club is that these are stories that are very well known uh, in many cases, known for decades. This one, not quite that long. And we've just never read for whatever reason. So we read them for the first time, and then we discuss them with all of you. So this is the uh, Aaron Dodderman Mighty Thor, issues one through five from 2015. Michael, I want to know, what did you think of the story? And if you would like, you can start with the art, because I know how important that is to you. Well, when you said that you wanted to do this one, I I said immediately, I want to do this one for sure, because I just love Russell Dodderman's art so much. Uh, So I was intrigued to see what he would do with a more fantastical kind of world like Asgard. And uh, it, it was a really, really, to me, like a visually right up my alley like like what i like uh right now in comic books and uh the story i'm not a huge fan of like lord of the rings and like you know like that and like game of thrones and stuff like i'm not really into like all that but um yeah something that i derisively (laughs) just lump together when i just say yeah i'm just not really that into hobbit shit you know it's just my thing yeah and it's just not my thing yeah it um, it really isn't mine either but i love thor so uh and i love russell dodderman so i thought let's give this a go and uh i I enjoyed it uh i don't know that i would read on i'm not sure but uh i really did enjoy these five issues yeah yeah well you know it it sort of ends like the cliffhanger part is that the odinson thor that we all know is uh being held captive and i there is a part of me that's like i'd kind of like to see him get inserted into all this and uh see how that goes but uh eric i would like to ask you your thoughts on the mighty thor thunder in her veins which uh, I believe is uh, something that uh, you try to describe about an act with your wife, but uh, she has no longer let you refer to it as thunder in her veins. It's now just a tropical storm at best, <laughs> and, and it's probably going to be downgraded from that. Uh, right, nope, she just yeah. texted me. It's a tropical depression. <laughs> <laughs> they are better than a desert. Uh uh, fair. I, I had a kind of a mixed reaction to this because um, Thor was definitely one for me growing up, like, you know, reading Marvel comics. I didn't really seek out Thor very much. Um, I think that was the same with you, right, Christian? Like you were in. Yeah, I read a lot of the, the Walt Simonson run and uh, continued on. Actually, there's a Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends stretch. But uh, the Walt Simonson one I thought was so inventive with like Beta Ray Bill and my all-time favorite Thor story, which I talk about many times on some of the other shows that I do, uh, Frog Thor, 
or also oh, known yeah, as yeah. Throg. When he gets turned into a frog, I'm just like, I, I love every minute of oh, it. Oh, yeah. No, I'm because... here all day long for Throg. <laughs> for Throg, yeah. I, and, and, you know, and Jane Foster, I, I mean, the storyline of her being sick and, you know, becoming Thor as like her last hurrah. There's some really great lines in there. And in fact, the, the more personal it was, the better for me it was as a read. Uh, but like similar to Michael, like I, I, I really, or yourself, apparently, I'm really not into Hobbit shit either. I love Lord of the Rings. I, my honeymoon was in New Zealand, actually, uh, right when the third one was coming out. And so like, I mean, I, I, I those are amazing, but I, I don't really seek out fantasy. I, I didn't really do it as a reader. I didn't really do it with my comic books, uh, you know, and and so for this, it leads, you know, hard into the, the fantasy, the God stuff, which can work at times. I love the artwork on this. I it was really it, it definitely visually was so fun to kind of I mean, I was on my Kindle with it, but to flip through it all was a real treat. So I'm glad I read it. I did feel like I kind of jumped into something where they didn't really set up the sides. It's a civil war kind of story, which I thought was really interesting, but I didn't, I felt like I was almost in some ways ill-equipped to, to feel uh, the, the ramifications of the civil war uh, within Asgard. But um, I mean, it was enjoyable read. I, I'm, I'm glad you, you recommended this one. Um, and, but it wasn't, it didn't draw me in as much as our other books have over the past couple months. No. And yeah, I think that uh, Thor is always somewhat inaccessible. And I think in more recent yeah. times, as the movies have figured out the right tone, uh, you know, the uh, series has sort of been able to reflect that uh, about mm, two and a half years ago, you know, they've, there've been like, I don't know, five Thor number ones in the last decade because they keep resetting it. And, and all uh, kinds most, of names for it. Like yeah, the most Thor, recent the one Thor. Uh, started with Donny Cates and Thor ended up being the Herald of Galactus. And it was the first time I'd read any Thor stories in, I don't know, maybe 20 years, at least 15. And uh, something about it really just connected with me. And I was like, oh, they kind of they've kind of figured him out a lot better. You know, uh, it, it, look, the way that he talks can be enough to make you just you know uh and jane didn't really talk that way she did it in the first issue and then she didn't really talk like that again which i i found yeah. uh, surprising you know it was almost like an editorial decision is like she has to stop talking you know like the, the, the howie berry school of uh accents as we call it around the, here right uh, also known as the kevin costner school of uh, accents you know but uh same what difference film was that the, Robin and Robin Prince Hood. of Thieves. Uh, at, he's at British some point, in three scenes, and, and that's and it. Then, and the rest of it, you think he's a Chicagoland dock worker. Uh, but <laughs> in any case, the, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, having a new Thor, having it be Jane Foster, I think made it a little bit more accessible because you still have all the Asgard stuff. But I mean, this is this isn't like when she became Thor. Like that had already happened prior to this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in fact, as I was determining what to read, I settled on this one because the cancer storyline seemed to be in the forefront, and that's what I think was uh, most clearly reflected in Thor: Love and Thunder, which is now available on on Disney Plus. Have you had a chance to watch it yet, Michael, or not yet? Yes, I watched it. Wow. Uh... Uh, you, a day or sometime two in the last few days. So, what yeah. did you think of the movie? Uh, and did, did that? Did you watch the movie after you read this or before you read this? Uh, before okay. I watched this, before I read this, yeah. So, what uh, did you think of the movie, just in general terms? Uh, I liked it. Uh, the thing that was kind of most irritating to me was. Rock guy, Tycho on TV. Korg. Korg. Yeah, like when they blew him up, I was like, oh, finally, like enough of this, like song <laughs> and dance. And then come to find out the one thing that wouldn't stop talking, his face was the only thing left behind. So kind of like, eh. yeah. But uh, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. I like the camp. I don't, I mean, 
I don't like when the comic books are just strictly so serious and you don't get like kind of a funny series every once in a while. So I thought it was needed. Like, I think that yeah. it's important to show like all different aspects of the Marvel universe and a lot of it's campy and especially in the older days and this, yeah. you know, kind of harkens to that, but. Well, I think that there's a reason that why both you and I like Excalibur as much as I uh, as we do. I'm talking about the original late '80s run, the the very silly, tongue in cheek uh, uh, era of it. And yeah, uh, Eric and I uh, at one point we felt like we were in the minority on Thor: Love and Thunder because we liked it, as Thor says in the movie, it's a classic Thor adventure. Don't think too much about it; just have fun. Uh, although I did get a message from a friend who was watching it for the first time last night. He's like, yeah, I'm 20 minutes in and I think I'm on uh, uh, Gore, the God killer side. I'm like, you know what? He's kind of like Thanos in the way that like up yeah, until yeah. a point, you're like, you're making sense. You're making sense. You're making sense. Whoa, hold on too much. You know? <laughs> so uh, as, as all good villains, you know, they usually start with a point and you go like, huh, starting to make some sense. But uh, yeah, I, I thought that movie was fun. Uh, I think that uh, this is able to really kind of, you know, having the book be from Jane's point of view, I think really helps uh, amplify that theme and just, you know, her dealing with the cancer. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, it, the one of the things I thought, and you tell me if you agree, Eric, is it just made you realize what a good job they did in the film of, uh, you know, the contrast between Thor, Natalie Portman and cancer ridden Jane, Natalie Portman. And we really get to see that, you know, obviously it, it's much easier to do in a comic, but uh, the contrast, I think it, it just reminded me of how much they did in the movie. What did you think as you read this, Eric? You know, I think because the comic has, a, you know, a little more luxury in terms of like getting us into her head. Um, you know, I actually found the stuff involving her, be it chemo or I guess it was chemotherapy that she had not yeah. radiation per se, but I actually, I found that really powerful and in ways that the movie didn't necessarily go as far down that road. Like she, even at the, those early scenes, you know, she looked like Natalie Portman. She looked better than most of the universe, you know, even when she's sitting there getting chemo. But I mean, towards the end of the film, we saw her more look sickly, but, those early scenes made chemo seem like, eh, you know, it's okay. And it's not, it's horrible. And I thought the comic book reflected that really s smartly. And the, it, and the, um, the description of like what it felt like the, you know, the veins in her veins and it was cold and hot. And I found that writing to be really effective uh, in ways that I, I don't think would have worked in the movie anyway, because then it would have gotten a little treachy, a little melodramatic. So I, I think the movie smartly did what it had to do, um, but the comic wasn't afraid to be cut, start on a pretty dramatic note, actually. So um, I actually found bo both worked, one far more grounded, weirdly enough, than the other, and the one that's more grounded is the comic book, weirdly enough. You know, often you would think it'd be the other way around. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, you know, a character obviously present in this book, uh, that could not be present in the movie, much to the relief of Michael Shirley, is Loki. Um, and uh, Michael, for those that don't know, not a fan of Tom Hiddleston, Loki. Uh, you are definitely in it, it on an island all of your own in, in that respect. But you rule that island. You're very happy on that island. And you will continue to live on that island <laughs> until the rest of your days. But <laughs> Loki in the book... I'm wondering, uh, what did you think of this iteration of Loki? A sort of, you know, proudly uh, return to villainy Loki, uh, trying to impress his frost giant daddy Loki. What did you think of this specific Loki? I thought that they modeled this Loki exactly after Tom Hiddleston's portrayal of Loki. So that's pretty much all I think it, about that. Exactly though, right? what I thought. And I wondered if you felt the same way, if you felt like, uh, you know, there was the section with like all the, the many different Lokis, yeah, which yeah. Uh, that reminded me, of course, of the, the TV series on mm -hmm. Disney Plus. But uh, yeah, one of those Lokis, I'm like, yeah, that's the Loki I used to read comics with, you know. 
not not the Tom Hiddleston. Uh, uh, let's just call him Loki Suave. I think is really yeah, what that they're going for. I'm all for like leotard Loki. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I look. I am too. Uh, what did you think, Eric? Uh, well, one. I, I was focusing a lot on his facial hair. I don't know if you all have that experience too. A little bit. I, I had a lot of questions about it. It was very detailed and a very, you know, kind of, that was like my like high school facial hair. It looks know, like kind someone drew it with a squiggle wiggle. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm here for the props. Uh, I'm always here for prop comedy. So, uh, yes, we, yeah. we are the uh, carrot top of Geekscape. <laughs> and I say that for a specific reason, Michael. <laughs> I, I, love, I love Carrot Top. He loves Carrot Top. Yeah. Oh, as you should. Call He's me fine. Carrot Top. He, Call me. Yeah. And well, you two have Single. a very similar build, as do I, actually. So I could totally see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Th well, this Loki too. I, I the the moment where he turns on his mom, I thought yeah. was kind of great uh, because you know it's like, yeah, I'm a villain again, and he's like, ah, I'm not. But with Loki, the fun of Loki is you always know at some point he's gonna he's gonna f some stuff up. And yeah. him stabbing his mom. That was a scene that I actually said out loud very quietly. Oh, dear. And I never say, oh, dear. <laughs> no. And yet no, I, I did. I've, I've known you long enough to know that you are not a big, oh, dear guy. <laughs> no. Oy vey, sure. But, oh, dear, not so much. Uh -huh. um, and then I love that little postscript where, like, uh, I know you know your way around poison. So either you're kind of like you're really, like, good at it or really terrible at it. And so you get yeah. that sense he didn't intend to kill her in that postscript, but it still was a great moment. And I did like how that played out. I kind of wish Loki, I don't know, was a little more involved in the story in terms of driving the narrative. Yeah. Kind of felt more like he was a passenger. I did like that. They sort of featured this moment, you know, Jane as our narrator, remembering her early, earliest okay. dealings with Loki and, you know, sort of, pointing to the fact that the earliest Thor stories were Loki kidnaps Jane Foster so that Thor comes after her and then he can, you know, try and kill Thor. And, uh, you know, he has no idea who she is and, uh, you know, references, I think it was one of the, one of the alternate, uh, Lokis, uh, one of the variants, if you will, who was like, why don't we just kidnap somebody she loves? You know, it was almost like, yeah, that's what we do, you know? <laughs> uh, and I, and I, I did appreciate sort of the, the self-awareness. That's not like a, a she Hulk wink and a, you know, talk to the camera, but it, right, it is, right, right. I did appreciate the self-awareness of it. Um, yeah. It's the, when Loki is done, right. Whether it's on the screen or on the page, or I suppose there must be a podcast version of Loki somewhere. Uh, I would say that uh, you don't really know for sure what side he's on because he's only on his own side. So he's playing everybody. And uh, that is a reason to at least consider for me uh, reading the next volume of this, just to kind of see, you know, where it goes. Did he actually want to give the appearance of killing his mother but not actually kill her mm -hmm. he know, just that, wanted uh, to poison her for a second yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's, for well that's the thing when loki poisons you it's just the tip so you know you just always have to you always have to know uh just just how much it's very well, there was a it's very shakespearean, it's very shakespearean to poison oh well, sure death, for sure way. uh th there was a great line in there too that was actually jane foster's like you know, in her thoughts where it's like something her dad said to her about, you know, someone's like kind of bad news. Like even when they smile, you, they make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, That's a great description of Loki, uh, you know, and both Tom Hiddleston's performance, um, but then also uh, in the comic, you know, like when he's smiling, you know, he's up to some shit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a very like, character. there's a very like used car dealer politician yeah. quality to like, you know, like, Oh, this is a really big smile. You know, and, uh, you know, to uh, mention back to uh, the X-Men uh, universe for a moment, uh, you know, the great character of Mojo is always smiling. He's never not smiling, you know, so uh, there's there's something to be said for that. 
Um, but uh, I haven't read anything with Mojo in it in a long time. Do they even still use him, Michael? I think. No, I think that... he got his okay. own uh, issue in X Men Black. Or, okay, you know, a couple of years ago. That's good because uh, I, I you know, n- and... not a Claremont creation and uh, Anne Nascenti, Arthur Adams creation from the Long Shot miniseries, but uh, and you know. he was in. Uh... X, the new X Factor around, I think around issue mm, around 13, I think, okay. or Mojo World for a while. Well, maybe one day we'll get to visit Mojo World, but until then, we'll stay here. Um, what uh, what do we think about the, the actual, you know, the story that ran through these five issues, which for the most part is kind of the, the elf war but then also the Civil War and Asgard, you know, the Dark Elves versus the Light Elves, which I don't, I didn't know I was invested in uh, that much. Um, I do, I remember Malkith very well. Uh, and do somehow, you? Well, yeah, because uh, that was like the, uh, the, the Walt Simonson like split face of his was, uh, it was very pronounced in my memory. So I was like, oh, yeah, I haven't seen him in a long time. Like the last time I saw him, probably Balder the Brave was around. So that's how oh, long wow. it was. Balder. And, uh, uh, you know, I was a little disappointed that we didn't get any Beta Ray Bill in this book. But uh, we did get the Warriors 3 and a lot of the other supporting characters, um, including Heimdall. Uh, you know, so and it, that I mean, a lot of times now when I've I've read some of these more recent volumes, you just feel like they're really writing them for people who do watch the movies, and they're like, "We'll catch you up enough." Yes, it's set in our continuity that goes back like eighty years, or I guess in the case of Thor, what you know, five thousand years or something. I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but whatever the case. <laughs> Uh, you really feel like they're just trying to have continuations of the the movies because look, that's who's going to pick these up for the first time. Um, do you uh, did you find you know you were kind of saying that you felt like this Loki was really the Tom Hiddleston Loki? Did you find that that was the case for a lot of the book, Michael, or uh, for the most part? Did it manage to feel like the same Thor that however much you had read before this, did it feel more consistent with that or more consistent with the movies? I mean, well, you know, Thor, Thor, Thor Odinson isn't like in this book. Uh, But I I read the, I read the uh, first issue a few days ago and then I finished them up this morning and I just watched the movie. Uh, it it seems like they took a lot from this book for the movie. Uh, along with it, this weird, like, kind of not really explained, like, how Jane is so, like, quickly wrapped up into this Asgardian society. Like, they... It's really just like, oh, yeah, that was Thor's girlfriend. She can do whatever she wants. It's kind of like the attitude. And it that seems, like, really unfleshed out in both of these. Like, it seemed like... Do you ever remember, like, her and Valkyrie ever having that much, you know, to do with each other? Like, like was... No, I mean, you know, if we're talking about on the screen, Valkyrie. Yeah, you know, we didn't meet Valkyrie until right. uh, Ragnarok, so After they had never. Were... Yeah, so it's yeah. just like you want to think. I guess they've met before, but like probably not. And it was just kind of weird that they were also in sync, and that they would let like an outsider just in and just accept this whole whole like Thor. <laughs> Did you hear what I almost said? This whole Thor thing uh with a completely different person and a completely different gender literally changes the person's hair color to like blonde it's just it's all a little sketch to me but i guess you just have to be willing to accept that and move on for it to to just get past it like and go and they, they didn't know her identity right was not something in the no, book no, too where no one knows except for um her buddy, who I love, by the way. Yeah. Oh, that big uh, old the, round guy. 
Is 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 that Vol Stagger? Did I make that up? You, you mean catch. my costume for Halloween twenty <laughs> two? <laughs> the guy that accompanies um, her to like her. Yeah, he, go, he goes. I, to chemo, I yeah. loved him, by the way. I it, it, they only to, had yeah, a couple. I, moments. I always liked him. We're talking about this fella. Yeah. I, I, that was my favorite shot. I love that. We're just. Yeah, you have someone to take you home and it's out him in the waiting room. Yeah, she with, with his hand in a bag of chips, which is yeah, I like detail. that touch. Yeah, that Look, he falls asleep. Uh, much, much like I have, uh, Eric has uh, no doubt been on hand for the birth of two children, and there's a lot of downtime when you're when you're the fella. So uh, yeah. I uh, definitely fell asleep with my hand in a bag of chips. So. Oh, yeah. oh, Not yeah, a no, lot of I... downtime when you're the mama. No, 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 no. no. It is the you get opposite kick of kicking to get out. I mean, and, yeah, they're. I, I, I'm, oh, unless... you're talking about before they're born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is the before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is a, there after. is plenty of downtime for us. And Lauren uh, made sure to to get a bunch of pictures of me asleep, <laughs> like during those days. Like it was hysterical. Like anytime I. N- nodded off like she she grabbed a camera and made sure that that was part of the album it was me un- just you know like totally yeah. out uh, but i was awake when both arrived so i had that going for me it's, yeah uh, about when they were made uh one of them for certain the other one maybe he, he may not have even been in the in the house <laughs> oh, I think, milkman! I think I sent her a letter, and that was all it took. I'm, I'm not good. <laughs> Snail mail, mind you. Of course, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I I I appreciate the supporting cast. I mean, they are so well defined, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's it would be interesting to have uh, you know read this when it first came out because they're. Well, they would have had two Thor movies by then, I guess, because Dark World would have come out before 2015. So um, I don't know. It would have been interesting to see how it would have felt at that point. But also some of this stuff is clearly so referred back to. But in general, I mean, I'd say at face value, I enjoyed this book. Um, I am intrigued a little bit about where it goes, but. I may not actually go through the process. Like some of those other ones, like Dr. Strange, I kept reading. We did Ms. Marvel. Uh, partially I kept reading because I wanted to get to the issue with Wolverine when we did Ms. Marvel last month. But uh, how many you issues know. did you read? I read like nine Wolverine. Like we okay. did, I think we did one to five with Ms. Marvel mm-hmm. and uh, Wolverine was in like issue seven. So uh, I was always going at least that far <laughs> because I had seen the cover and, uh, you know, look, I talked about it last month, but uh, that is, I think, a Logan I always enjoy reading. The one with sort of like the, you know, the young, superpowered individual that he takes under his, his very wise wing. You know, the, the Jubilee, Kitty Pride, Katie Power sort of role that, uh, you know, he's, you know, he's a really good dad to everybody except uh, X-23, but that's neither here nor. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, somebody who did enjoy the movie, this would be a good series to read. Would you yeah. uh, recommend this to you're saying? Yes, Michael. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Eric, would you say the same? Whether somebody did or didn't like the movie, I suppose. Yeah. Because uh, I know our friend Kate did not like that movie, but I feel like, well, then just read this. I think you'd probably uh, probably enjoy it. Um, the, well, the, Eric, there's you, enough here. Go to, ahead. Yeah. Well, well, I was gonna say there's enough here to recommend. I, I mean, I don't know if you guys found this, but I, I found it just really hard because the sort of setup, the world build, it, it, it seemed like it was a continuation of like another series and and i know like when they go back to number one oftentimes you know it's like a soft reboot so to speak but i found like there was a lot and they occasionally you know as they do in comics they reference other issues but i I yeah i mean there was a reference in this to to like to thor number eight from 2014 which this is 2015 so i'm like so did they not even get to 12 before they started again you know love those number ones yeah, they sell well. <laughs> but don't step I mean, in number they used two. To. They yeah. still do. I, I guess, yeah. And then, and then we always get the good old fashioned legacy numbering to come back around. Yeah. Uh, we just. I got... appreciate that they're keeping count for me. Well, because then, then you can sell 
yet another uh, milestone issue. You can sell those number ones, and then you can also sell Amazing Spider-Man 900, you know? So, um, something to get any, excited about. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the 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 current uh, Zeb Wells, John Romita Jr. run on Spidey, I think, is uh, better than uh, a lot that I had read recently. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. I, I enjoy those visuals, for sure. But... Eric, I know you sent me a uh, an avalanche of images that uh, I want to share for our visual audience. But don't worry, audio listeners, describe we'll them. describe them. Yes, uh, we'll be like, painstakingly we'll be like a, slow detail. Yeah, we'll Bro, be like uh, FDR's fireside chats when the uh, newspapers were all on strike, and he described. Yeah, and then and then in the next panel, little Abner says. <laughs> So, uh, what were some of the things? Do you want me to just cycle through them and then? Uh, whatever. Uh, Listen, you're you're the DJ and the rapper. I'm just the the guy who hangs out with this craft cra well, services. No. Uh, earlier, I was talking about uh, Mal Keith, and uh, I do think that he is visually striking, and uh, to show him on screen in a film might be uh, easier said than done. But uh, what, was this image that you chose? Was it because of what he said or how he looked? So, uh, well, first I, I do love the design of him. So, uh, yeah. you know, but I, I also love the idea of a villain so arch. Shall we drink a, co a toast, my friends, to the pleasures of war? You know, that's like yeah. something like Mr. Burns might say. So it's just so <laughs> like a mustache twirling, uh, or I guess yeah. in his case ear twirling uh, villain um i thought he was I, I liked him but i don't think they used him enough i mean it, it it was setting up what felt like you know the next series of issues more so than i thought he was gonna be a bigger cog in the in the sort of engine of this story but i i did find like they sent him up he seemed kind of interesting and then i don't know i don't know if you guys felt this too it just sort of like disappeared yeah, I mean, I think the fact that they shifted back to Asgard when they did, I'm like, oh, uh, when he, you know, tricks the queen into marrying him, or really, that's all the enchantress. Uh, the um, I was just like, oh, no, now I care about that story, you know, but I guess when you're publishing yeah. an ongoing monthly book, uh, I guess that's the way to do. It. What do you think, uh, Michael? Do you feel like they underutilized him, or was it just the right amount, and you wanted to get back to Asgard? Well, this isn't a Mal Keith story or whatever. It's like yeah. you know, in the credits, would be like with Mal Keith. <laughs> um, I honestly got into it when Enchantress came yeah. in, and that was like a really blended surprise because I've always really had kind of an affinity for that character and really would love to see her introduced through Thor but I'd love to see her on the big screen with like versus Wanda or like yeah. with the Wanda uh, I, I just think that's a really fun character but uh, I, I, I did like um, how easily he tricked them yeah, it's just like a little, a little too comic book perfect, but um, I wasn't like hugely invested in him. I guess. Oh, I, yeah. I did like his wedding vows, though. That was oh, something I yeah. sent you because it <laughs> reminded true. me of the greatest wedding vows ever, Ming the Merciless from Flash Ooh. Gordon. Short and sweet. Yeah, you, like, throw her I, in I don't. The I, I do have something. the wedding vows, but yeah. uh, that was the honeymoon. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember uh, the uh, Ming the Merciless wedding vows. But uh, uh, do you take uh, this bride to be your bride of the hour of the hour? Yes. Do you promise <laughs> not to blast her off into space until such time as you may grow weary of her? Certainly. <laughs> that's a, that's the best. I, I try to work that into yeah. my wedding, but um, you know, I wanted to actually get married, and that was kind of a deal breaker. So. Yeah. So what he says in this book is war waits for no elf, as they say. So let us skip to the most important part. I do with all my blackened heart. <laughs> but uh, then, of course, she's like, I I do too. I I do, you know. And uh, 
I know that uh, for you, Eric, you appreciated the vows, but perhaps just as much appreciated the realization of what she had done. And uh, <laughs> I believe that it reminded you of a, a, a night in particular uh, that, uh, that, that a night 19 shared. years ago at a temple yeah. in Delaware. Yes. God, Where, what have I done? No. Yeah, <laughs> And then, uh, and then, of course, he's like a toast, my dear friends. So yeah, you, know, <laughs> you with you with the gang from uh, that that you knew from New Ark, Delaware, uh, of course, were uh, all circling around you. And by the way, I envision your gang basically being the same composition as the gang from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, because I feel like everyone <laughs> from that part of the country has the same group of friends. You know, basically. Well, really, you just had Charlie. I don't think you actually had anybody else. I, I had like yeah. seven Charlies, and, yeah, that's, and that's it. <laughs> Any group of Philly guys I know, there are like seven Charlies. That's that's oh, pretty, pretty much. much. There are zero Ds and like a half a Dennis. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I I did find that to be uh, entertaining, and uh, I'm like, well, they're gonna have to sort that out at some point, aren't they? You know, and like, is Jane going to go like rush off and try and fix that? Or is that one of those ones where like, you know, two years later, they're like, oh, yeah, remember that? Oh, we should, <laughs> uh, we should really do something. She's about still that. in the dungeon. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. So I, I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I found those all to be uh, high points, though. I, I enjoyed. Uh, I don't know. I enjoyed some of those visuals. There is some comedy, which uh, I think is something we've come to expect from the Thor, uh, whether he be mighty, he or she be mighty or otherwise. And, uh, you know, it's it's not a character that should be funny, but uh, they have figured out the correct tone. Uh, one of the things that you sent to me, though, was uh, sort of Jane taking on uh, a few of the the hammer guard, I believe. Now this image that I'm sharing with her visual audience, was it because she says, yeah, yes, is that it was. really why? Yeah. I was like, I, think, I know you well enough. I'm like, I think it's yes. probably because of the it's all about one. the gog or the gag. Um, <laughs> there was a series of words in there that I don't think I've yeah. ever seen in a comic to indicate like, uh, you know, sound of, I don't know, hammer being crushed against someone's skull. But yeah. this was one in a series where all of them, it's as if they ran out of every other word. Or it was just really late at night, and they're like, "What about gag? They're like, is that, <laughs> can we put that in there? It's two a.m. I want to get home, so gag. Yeah, like, yeah oh why God. not gag? Yeah, like the cocoon and wadoom like stuff is what yeah, we're just yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. You see that a lot in uh, like new Batman comics. DC does a lot of kawaka doos and <laughs> kadonga doo dongs. I, I, Baba I once saw. Not spelled the way mine was, but on the 66 Batman show, once the sound effect was blat, but it was B-L-A-T-T. But I like I took it. it. I'm like, that's me. I'm a Batman sound effect. <laughs> and and uh, that's, you know, look. Look at you now. I know. Claims to fame are, are, are very fleeting at times. Uh, you know, we were speaking about the Enchantress earlier. And uh, so there's a, a very wordy passage where she's uh, interacting with Malkeith. So was there something about this interaction or was it what they were saying? What was this uh, about? What was it about this for you, Eric? <laughs> Let's see. Now it's funny. Now it's like, I got to zoom myself. Um, yeah. But she, he's saying your time will come, my dear Amora. Uh, I promise you, which I guess, uh, you know, and she's uh, weary of his promises and, uh, you know, very wordy. Some of these uh, books, uh, I guess uh, Tom Orzachowski was uh, unavailable for the lettering. And Yeah, uh, it, it was one, too, where I this is where it would it would kind of lose me a bit, too. Is like, yeah. join me in the dock council. Where it was like, OK, yeah. like exposition, two spoonfuls at a time. It's like, you know, they. And I get it, we, you know, with the comic, you have the panel, and they're trying to keep the subplots going, but it was like some moments like that where I found myself like kind of wanting to get to the next panel, get back to the other story. Yeah. It's like they're trying too hard to get so, so much in there in one panel, which yeah, when I we did the appreciate. When we did the George Perez Wonder Woman, there was uh, there had been a lot of 
sort of those moments where you were like, Ooh, there are going to be a lot of words here. But uh, I mean, some of these visuals, yeah. are great, you know, that's they, when I, I was like, I don't want to read this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you... Yeah. Well, but I do like right. him saying, I'm trying to run a war here, my dear. Like yeah. the, it is such an over that what's funny too, because this guy would make sense in, you know, Ragnarok's kind of comedic tone, but yeah. it, it's, it is very different from the rest of the tone of these issues we read. So I found like those, that subplot and that character as enjoyable as I found him on, it did feel like it was just from such a different source as the yeah. rest of it. So I, you know, again, kind of as much as I like this, I just bumped up against a lot of it because the tonal shifts or just throwing too much plot at us, too much exposition all at once. So it, it wasn't as smooth as some of our other recent reads. Yeah, no. But uh, one of the things that you referenced earlier was not just Loki, but uh, specifically his facial hair. So I feel like you chose this because uh, this uh, looks as though, uh, you know, he's... I don't know, like 15, whatever the equivalent yeah. is in Asgardian years. And he just can't, well, he just can't get wiggle, good, wiggle. Yeah. He just can't get a good beard going. <laughs> um, and uh, I do love uh, the, the symbols for swearing in comic books. I haven't run into that oh, yeah. in a while. You used to get it a lot more, uh, but uh, uh, this is a good, I thought that this was a good Loki speech that he had, you know, he's just like, I am Loki. Yeah. yeah. And a Loki isn't a slave to the whims of his ancestors. A Loki writes his own story. And since you've been dead for so very long, Father, I'll forgive you for not knowing. But my story has been rather fan-fucking-tastically good for a long time. Uh, for quite a long damn while now. So uh, double uh, double uh, expletives in there from the uh, Prince of Lies. Prince of Mischief, as he were. Um, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that uh, these, I feel like these are probably fun characters to write because of the sort of over the top uh, nature of, you know, who they are. And uh, I, I I find Loki can be very entertaining. And the more Lokis you get, the better. And as we referenced, there were sort of the Loki variants. And that was one of the things that, uh, that Eric highlighted. You did notice just how many uh, there's a, we don't have alligator Loki in here, but we've got a cat Loki. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and then this one that as we look at him is to yeah. our right, his left. That's like, yeah, that's the Loki that's that I, real that Loki. I always read. Yeah. That's the one that I always read. The one that's like sitting on his throne with his goblet of mead empty and he's just too lazy to make somebody fill it for him. The, uh, the Loki that I liked was always full of trickery and yes, trying to kill people, but in the, uh, the X-Men uh, as guardian wars, there's this whole sequence after the shadow King had left behind karma and she like, was just disgustingly like, I don't know, 500 pounds. I'm not even sure how big she was because of the way Bill Sinkiewicz drew her. You weren't really sure if it was human. And she like wanders through the desert and she loses all of this weight. And Loki's had previously put everybody back the way they were when they got to Asgard. And he's like, not even I could do that to you where, you know, puts her back to the 500 pounds. Uh, so he had his moments, I guess is the point, you know? And I, I like that Loki where he's just like, I got nothing to gain from, uh, you, you know, from, <laughs> from this, this poor girl looking like that. Um, but I, I don't know. I think that, uh, I, I do agree with Michael's assessment. This is Tom Hiddleston Loki that they, they want to give people, but that's what people are going to be. What the used people to. want. That's what the people want. Everybody except you on your Island. <laughs> on, on your non Hiddleston Island, non Hiddleston, uh, non Han Island. Yeah, it's very actually, it's a a lot of people aren't allowed on that island. No, yeah. no. Oh, you mean Catherine Han? I thought you were talking about yeah. Harrison Ford. I was so confused. Yeah, no Catherine Han either. Um, when you say Han, <laughs> I assumed you were talking about Solo. Um, is that why you highlighted that image is because you liked how many Lokis we got? And it re I assume it reminded you of the TV series. Yeah. Well, and to the point, even the frame, um, yeah. the first time we saw the Lokis very much felt like it was completely inspired by that one. 
So, yeah, I mean, it's fun kind of seeing how this comic book definitely, you know, there are moments that felt like the Loki TV show grabbed a piece of a small piece, but a piece nonetheless. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was cool. I mean, the, the the idea that this series could inspire, you know, the sort of whole spectrum of Thor stories we currently have, including, of course, Loki's, which I know yeah. makes Michael happy that we have Loki season two. Yeah, um, I know why you picked this one because of what you titled the email. Uh, so yes. we have the Warriors three. Actually, I don't know. And actually, this is a different collection of characters. Uh, yeah, no, it's not so Sif. But anyway, uh, so <laughs> and I forget his name actually. The the blonde fellow. Uh, but all I care about is Hildegard. Yeah, well, yeah, Hildegard's not having none of it. No. <laughs> you know, she's like, I am not here for your bullshit. <laughs> And I never have, never will. Um, but uh, I assume it's because he looks the way he does. And he says, you're the one who belongs in a cell, serpent. Don't think for a second we don't see how you've bewitched your brother. <laughs> That's right. For the for the audio audience, Hulk Hogan, any chance to bring up the Hulk Hogan figure from She-Hulk or this where it says, uh, <laughs> I, Hogan, with a U. Yeah. Uh, it's, oh, I'm yeah, sorry, so is Hogan ho one of these characters? I guess Hogan is uh you know part of the the uh Asgardian favorites, you know. I don't, I don't quite know. And Hulk yeah, and this guy have never met each other, which feels like which would feels be the like fan should, yes, that, that actual Green Hulk should meet Hogan. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, I I a boy can dream. Yeah, a boy can dream. Um and uh speaking of dreams by the way, uh, before we wind down here for this month. Uh, next month, uh, we are going to leave Marvel for at least a little while. Not going so obscure, but much in keeping with the theme of uh, stuff we've heard of for a long time that uh, we know we should have read and just haven't. Uh, I think on uh, October 9th, which is a Sunday, but don't hold me to it, uh, we will uh, read the uh, first volume of Neil Gaiman's Sandman, which is currently uh, a series on Netflix, which I've started, by the way. I was I was going to watch the Lord of the Rings show on Amazon, and I was like, yeah, I can't pull the trigger on that. Let me watch Sandman. I've wanted to watch that for a while. So that'll be our, uh, our next story uh, here for the book club. So uh, find us here on Geekscape, I believe, on October 9th. Uh, sometime in the evening we're we like to play fast and loose with our schedules and all of yours uh what are our uh sort of final thoughts on this thor volume thunder in her veins i'll ask you first michael uh, i think this was uh and will continue to be a really important story in the thor continuity it gives some relatable change uh you were speaking earlier about how you know most people can't relate to being a god and just <laughs> dealing with those troubles you know for i don't know like 50 years so uh it's you know it definitely uh added a real feminine touch which it seems they they're really enjoying messing with kind of gender roles and the asgardian and like more fantasy kind of stuff in the MCU. And uh, yeah, I would, like uh, you asked earlier, I would recommend it to anyone who wants to know about Thor or Jane or um, just, you know, any of the MCU movies as comic books, I'd say, you know, this is a really good one. Yeah, I think for people who specifically liked Love and Thunder. I think that this is a this is a great you know first volume to crack open and uh, go from there. Uh, what about you, Eric? Uh, your Jerry Springer final thoughts here as uh, we <laughs> wind down talking about uh, Thunder in Her Veins. Yeah, I, I think I would recommend if like you're not super up to speed on Thor, maybe do a little bit of homework before starting page one. That's Just fair. Yeah, who these some of the characters are how you know jane getting there as the new thor that will be being said i mean the fact that for five issues we didn't have the thor we you know we're used to 
we didn't have the male Thor, and I I didn't miss him, which I thought was kind of interesting too. Like yeah. I liked Jane's role in this. Um, I really did like the. Um, you know, we're so used to seeing Loki betray everyone, his family, and anyone who ever puts a little faith in him. I I. I really dug that it was Odin and his wife were like at war with each other and it felt kind yeah. of Shakespearean, you know? And, and so I thought like the family dynamic was interesting, this kind of civil war element, which they built it up a little bit as mentioned, but I, I do think the, the illustrations alone might be a reason to take a look at this. And, you know, they, they definitely like have enough of a sense of humor along the way, you know, like when Jane, can say like after everything i've gone through it felt good to punch a god in the face and like that that's it was a really uh you know definitely yeah. moments of uh introspection i thought really played nicely on the page so it, it's definitely worth it but just be warned if you're not uh you know completely in the know on thor and on your gods it, you might want to do a little bit of homework oh yeah, my no, gosh yeah that. no, that's true if you're might not caught up in your gods gods or your goshes. I feel like this uh, storyline offends Eric's Jewish faith. Why would it? I, I, there was no no harm fell upon any pastrami or gefilte the fish. I was fine. <laughs> uh, no, but the uh, and uh, I, I should have looked up uh, whether or not that that character's name is Volstag. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the co-worker waiting in the waiting room, uh, he would have uh, demolished pastrami and gefilte fish uh, had it been anywhere in his sight. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I enjoyed having an excuse to read this, you know, because yeah. uh, a lot of times after a movie, I think, like, oh, yeah, I'd really like to read some of that. And then I just, um, well, I don't get around to it. So uh, in any case... Uh, very excited to have uh, gotten the opportunity to share this with everyone. And uh, as I said, we'll be back, I believe, October 9th, talking about Sandman. Uh, until then, Eric, where can people find you? Yeah, come and visit me, Instagram or Twitter at Count Eric Connor. And Michael? Can you where? find me uh, on Instagram at I Hate Michael Shirley and on Twitter at Michael X Shirley. And uh, you can always find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian DMZ. For those of you watching live or possibly the day after, uh, tomorrow, uh, September 12th, I'll be a guest on the main Geekscape podcast, uh, giving my thoughts on the announcements we got out of D23, uh, specifically the Marvel ones, any Marvel announcements that we didn't get uh, in terms of uh, pretty much anything about the Fantastic Four. Uh, Matt Shackman's directing and uh, a cast of our actors we still don't know. Uh, we will continue talking about that on the show that the three of us do over on my YouTube channel, The Black Cast, B L A D T C A S T, Thursdays, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, Michael. Uh, and uh, we'll start off talking about that. But right now, we're also doing uh, weekly reactions to. She-Hulk. And yes, my friend who's a copyright lawyer will be joining us on Thursday as we talk about the lawsuit at the center of that episode. Uh, <laughs> also, okay. uh, also on the Black Cast, I did just celebrate our 500th episode where I spoke with John Lovitz uh, for two hours. And uh, recently, uh, at the end of the week, we had four episodes last week. On the fourth episode, uh, we did uh, show some cameos that people had bought for us, including one purchased for me by Count Eric Connor. I almost called you Sir Eric Connor, but I suppose that's appropriate as we uh, talk about Asgardian things. Uh, from uh, Fred the Elephant Boy of the uh, Howard Stern show, Whack Pack, but also a wonderful uh, video montage uh, he compiled uh, along with uh, my wife, who came up with some people to say nice things about me, which is exactly why Michael was not featured in it because it was only people saying nice things about me. But you want me to send a video at like three in the morning? And I that's all right. I it's I, it's fine. I sent it, it was at uh, three in the morning. I I sent it them a week before that as well. Well, I didn't you see were... it until like I. Well, that's not my you... fault. And, and the, Michael, as... though, you might have been the highlight though. 
like Michael's yeah. uh, image with his suggestion, by the way, comment redacted. Yes, uh, under and the comment his, was redacted. Beautiful Look, looking headshot. As as two people who have received communication from Michael at three in the morning, it is best <laughs> that he did not record a video. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> all of that can be found on the Blackcast YouTube channel, B-L-A-D-T-C-I-S-T. Subscribe to the audio version over there. Uh, especially if you enjoy this kind of uh, in-depth conversation, uh, we do focus that on She-Hulk, and uh, we continue to do that every week over there. But that's all the time we have for this month. We'll see you next month on an episode that will only be able to be called Enter Sandman. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.